Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hope and Passion Ministries. I'm certainly glad to have you. I'm Shelly Prindle, and you've tuned in to our Genesis Bible study. We are so blessed to have Hope and Passion family and friends with us here this evening. We expect, fully expect God to meet us in a very special way. And I want to take a minute and say something that I was thinking about, well, probably an hour before we were going to go live. The thought struck me, I think I saw something on the news of the television, and the thought struck me that sometimes we as human beings get excited to meet another human being, maybe a, a famous person that we've wanted to meet. And so we get excited about the meeting, but we don't necessarily know that the famous person is excited about meeting us, right? You might want to meet someone and shake hands with them and get an autograph, and they may or may not even care that they are getting to know you. But you know what I was thinking about? It is so exciting to know that God wants to meet you here. Amen? He is infinitely above the greatest person that could ever exist. Infinitely more valuable than anyone who has a name that is famous. He is God Almighty and he longs to meet with us. That's why he sent Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. And I felt led to share with you a particular verse. I want you to know this. Even if nobody really cares about meeting with you, even if no famous person has ever cared to meet you, I want you to know that Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 says this. The Lord God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to think about that the God of the universe wants to meet with you. And I'll tell you what, his Holy Spirit is here. And we are glad that you are here to hear from God. What an exciting message from Genesis we have tonight. We're going to talk about how Abraham... 4,000 years ago, Abraham met Jesus and Abraham met the angels that would spare Lot from death in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to talk about that tonight. Thank you to all of our donors. I just want to say it overwhelms me to think of how many of you are givers on a very regular basis. You make your monthly contribution. You give gifts and extra gifts and we're so grateful. That's why we can do what we do. This is my full-time calling and God provides through what you give. He provides for all of our expenses, for live streaming, for website, for email service, for all the time and the effort that it takes to do everything we do. You can give easily on Venmo. Search for us. We are at Hope and Passion on Venmo. And you can give very simply at hopeandpassion.org. Hit the donate tab. You can set up recurring monthly payments. You can give one-time gifts. And like I always say, I love going out to my mailbox every day, receiving cards and letters and words of encouragement and donations right here in Irwin, Pennsylvania. We thank you. Of course, we are a 501c3 tax deductible religious organization. And we are just so happy that God has provided for us to keep preaching his word. And we intend to do that. Until we're raptured out of here or we die, okay? I've asked the Lord, Lord, please, if you're not going to rapture me first, when I die, just let me go down preaching. So that's kind of selfish because if you're watching and I die while I'm preaching, that could be a little disturbing. <laughs> but just know that that's what I prayed for, okay? All right. So we're going to get to our message here in just a second. If you have your Bibles... Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 17. This is a message anybody can understand. Uh, it's a narrative. It's history. It's Abraham about to have an encounter with Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus. And he's going to meet two angels that end up intercepting Lot and saving Lot before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Genesis chapter 17, I'm going to read the end of chapter 17, beginning at verse 22, and carry us through just a few verses into chapter 18. All right, here we go. Genesis 17, verse 22. 
When God had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those who were born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Now Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house, those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. And the Lord appeared to Abram by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. We're going to stop right there. That's enough for us this evening. We're going to stop right there. We're going to pray over this message and then we are going to dig in. There are so many golden nuggets of truth in God's word. How many of you have found that out? Uh, through this Genesis Bible study. The word of God is just full of nuggets of truth. Exactly when you need them, God is going to tell you what you need to hear. Amen? This is not a static study. You're not in a class. As much as I love calculus, and as much as I love uh, tutoring Taya with algebra, much as I love math, as much as you might love to study any particular thing, this is not a static, lifeless subject. We are studying the living word of God. And you need to expect him to meet you. And that's why we pray. Before we get into the word, we ask the Holy Spirit to meet us. Everybody needs something tonight. Amen? Does everybody need something? And some of you are saying, man, I need a lot. Okay. Well, God is here to meet you. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I ask for every person that's watching, young, old, anywhere in between, Lord, I pray for every person that's watching, rich, poor, anything in between, healthy, sick, anything in between. Lord, I pray for every single person you know and love each one. And I ask in Jesus' name, above all, that your Holy Spirit would touch us by the power of your word this evening. Lord, feed us. There is a famine in the world today for the teaching of the word of God. God, there are many churches, there are many ministers and ministries, but there's still a famine of your word being taught by the power of your Holy Spirit in all of its fullness. And so I pray that you would fill us up and help us to take from the bread of life this evening. And I thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Verse 23, Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Wow, I'm glad the lesson on circumcision is over. Are you? <laughs> that was a rough one. I remember praying hard before I had to teach on circumcision that night. But here's what's happened. In Genesis chapter 17, we had God come to Abraham and say, the sign of the covenant is circumcision. You need to circumcise all the males in your household. And so God had already told Abraham that. And then God promised Abraham that Ishmael was not the son of promise. God was not going to bring Jesus through Ishmael's line. God reiterated the son of promise is Isaac. He hasn't come onto the scene yet. He hasn't been born yet, but God said he's on the way. Hallelujah. I, was, I just had like a, an aha moment there. And I thought, isn't that interesting? The son of promise through which Jesus would come is not there yet, but don't worry, Abraham, he's on the way. And I think that God is saying to us this evening, Jesus, the savior, he's coming. He's on the way. This, the, the ultimate son of promise. Amen. So after these two events, Abraham gets busy being obedient. God said, circumcise every male in your household. 
God said the son of promise is coming, trust me. And so Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house and bought with his money all the males, and he circumcised them in the flesh of their foreskins that very day. Now Henry Morris said this, even though Ishmael was not to inherit the promises with Isaac, Abraham rightly desired to have him included among those receiving the spiritual blessings that would stem from the fulfillment of the promise. Ishmael was not the son of promise, but even Ishmael could get, could access relationship with God through the promise. Hallelujah. All right. And so Abraham cared about both of his sons. Now watch this. Abraham amazingly was 99 years old, 99 years old when he had to be circumcised. That's painful. And I want you to go back and remember that in that day, there was not even any ibuprofen. Think about that. He's 99 years old and he's going to be circumcised. And Ishmael was 13 years old. Now, when I was reading this through and I looked at that, the, the thought struck me is you've got a 99 year old and a 13 year old, and they're both doing the same thing out of obedience to the Lord. And so I wrote in my notes, Abraham's application of the word of God spans the age rages here. Does ours. Now, I'm, I'm, I pray that some of you that are parents are going to be convicted and that some of you that are teenagers and young people are also going to be convicted. Here's my question again. Abraham's application of the word of God spans the age rages. Does your application of the word of God span the age rages? I consider it, and those of you who know me well, you understand this. I consider it the greatest privilege, not just to preach to adults and the mature. I consider it the greatest privilege to teach children, to teach young people. And that's how God would have it. So many times when we're learning and growing in Jesus... We neglect or put to the side young people thinking, well, they can't possibly have a good or serious relationship with the Lord. That's a lie from the pit of hell itself. And Abraham, the father of our faith, showed that if you're going to apply the word of God, it applies across the age ranges. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 in the New International Version. Paul was writing to Timothy, who was a younger preacher. And Paul said to Timothy, don't ever let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in love in faith and in purity. Amen. And so many of you have commented, you're grateful. You love to see when Taya comes out and she prays with me or when she helps with communion, because I'm going to tell you something. This is what we should be doing for our children. And I am so excited. I got to tell you, I'm very excited. It's about as excited as I could be to move to tears that we also have a 10 year old young man who will be baptized on July 16th. How about that? We have a mom and a dad and a 10 year old getting baptized together because the application of the word of God goes across the age ranges. And it's time that the church of Jesus Christ act like that. God calls young believers to not allow others to look down on them simply because they are young. He encourages young people to be an example of what the Lord can do in life. Are we doing the same? And what I mean by that is, are we encouraging young people to be an example of what the Lord can do in a life? Jesus Christ is the creator. He can grab a hold of a child when they're two. The Holy Spirit can speak to, to babies. He can begin his work. I'm not getting into a discussion about the age of accountability and salvation. I'm, what I'm saying is that God begins to speak and work with children. And we need to be willing to do exactly the same. As a matter of fact, I sent this scripture to a dear friend. And I said, be encouraged about this. Because listen... One day, children were brought to Jesus so that he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. Imagine this. 
Here's Jesus Christ walking the earth. And people, probably parents, people that cared about them, started bringing their children, their little ones, to Jesus and wanted Jesus to touch them and to pray for them. Look who tried to stop it. The disciples rebuked the people. His disciples. They said, stop it. Don't bother Jesus with the children. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus laid his hands on them. And then he went away. Praise God. Do you see that? Sometimes it is the people who think that they are doing right in, in the name of the Lord that are actually doing wrong. And I want to tell you, if, if you have a preacher or a pastor or a religious leader that doesn't have the time of day for kids or is impatient when little children are asking questions or making some noise in the service or whatever's going on, I would be very wary of that. And my spiritual antenna I would go up because, to be honest, I love when kids are there. Even if they can't take everything in, they are taking something in. Praise God. And you know that I invest in young people and I've invested in and mentored one in particular. And I'm going to tell you what, this is what God desires. So if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're an aunt, if you're an uncle, if you're a friend, you take those young people under your wing and you bring them to Jesus. Bring them. Amen. Thank you for all the likes and the hearts. I know you got the technical department going wild here, so you must be agreeing with me. We've got to pass this on to the next generation. So maybe that's something you would want to underline in your Bible. Abraham was 99, Ishmael was 13, and they were all doing what the Lord told them to do. And Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Now listen to what Henry Morris said. How many excuses Abraham might have made? Okay, now I'm, now I'm going to get rough on the old people. I don't know who the old people are. I would never guess to label what an old person is, okay? But 99, I think we'd agree, is, is pretty rough, right? So Henry Morris said, how many excuses Abraham might have made? I'm an old man. The shock of cutting the flesh of my foreskin might be too much for my system. I'll find some other way to express my acceptance of the covenant. I'll offer a hundred head of cattle. I'll donate a sack of gold to relieve poverty in these parts. <laughs> no, Abraham was obedient. He took the knife to himself. His obedience was limitless obedience. Can I get an amen out there? When God calls you, thank you, Taya. When God calls you to do something, you don't make excuses and try to do something else instead. When God tells you to do something, when his word says, this is what is the right thing to do, this is obedience, then my friend, you've got to obey. And you can't say, well, I'm too old, I'm too young. I mean, we just got off the young people, right? Now let's talk about the old people. You can say, I'm too old. Hey, if God asks you to do it, he'll make a way for you to do it. And that very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. Look, that very day. Again, that's incredible. God tells Abraham to do this massive thing, like, like circumcise hundreds of people. And as soon as God tells him to do it the same day, what's he doing? He's taking out the knife again without ibuprofen, right? And circumcising the men. I hope that wasn't a spider in the studio. Oh my goodness. You guys... The Holy Spirit, he, he knows what's going on here. Can, oh, okay. So I'm preaching away, I'm preaching away, and there's a particular stand that the cameras are on that I'm looking into, and all of a sudden I see the technical department lean over toward the stand that the cameras are on, lean way over and go, and blew something onto the floor toward me. And so I had to ask, was that, I hope that wasn't a spider. Yes, that was a spider. So the technical department just blew a spider at me. Just so you know, just letting you know, okay? This is the sacrifice that I have to make. Okay, that very day, 
Henry Morris, all this was done on the same day God had spoken to him. This required a particular act of faith on Abraham's part, since it no doubt incapacitated all the males in his community for several days, thus leaving his home and possessions with no protection at all, save God. Think about that. You know, Abraham had been to war not long before this. Remember the war with the kings of the east and the, the kings of the plain and Abraham had, had gone and uh, taken Lot, you know, rescued Lot as a prisoner of war. So this was not an easy time to live in and Abraham taking the knife to all the males in his home, they would have definitely been incapacitated for some time. And so basically what Abraham was doing was saying, God, if you told me to do it, even though it's going to cost me, you must go, you will be taking care of me. I trust that you will. Amen. I got to ask you, what is God asking you to do in your life? What act of obedience, what are you having to take the knife to? What is God asking you to cut out of your life or to add or do in your life? And you say, but if I do this, it's going to leave this gap or this hole or this insufficiency. God is calling you to say, trust me. If I tell you to obey, I will provide for you. So here's a quote of that crazy lady, Shelley Prindle, right? Here's what she said. There exists no greater shield against the negative circumstances of life than obedience to God. Though obeying the voice of the Lord may appear to cost, so much as to bring detriment, it in fact brings the pleasure and protection of the Lord. When we stand in disobedience, we are open to all manner of loss. Does that make sense? You know, in the flesh, it might have looked like, wow, if I do this, I'm going to leave myself at risk. But no, when you obey God, you invite his divine protection, his divine protection provision and so abraham went ahead and did exactly what god asked him to do henry morris went on to say one can imagine there may have been a great many questions from his household that day and quite possibly some resistance nevertheless finally all submitted and this in itself must have been a testimony to the affected effectiveness of abraham's influence and esteem in his own household for him to be able to get every male servant, every member of his extended family, every one of them circumcised, they must have had some deal of respect for Abraham. They must have believed God is with that man. And if God told him to do this, it's important that we do it and that we submit. By this time, at least everyone knew that God was with Abraham and if this was what God asked of them, they, along with Abraham, would obey. Hallelujah. A life of integrity will lead people to believe what you say about God. So have integrity. Be like Abraham. Live for the Lord and mean it. And live for the Lord in front of people. Then when you go to testify something that the Lord is telling you, people will be more likely to say, hey, I know the Lord is with him. I know the Lord is with her. I'm going to take seriously what they're saying. That very same day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. Now, we're going to get into a neat discussion here. How many of you ever have trouble, uh, you know, with this question? Is there something that I have to do to be saved? Is there some particular work I need to do to be saved? Or am I simply saved by believing? It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to wrap your mind around, isn't it? That it's only by belief. And the reason this is on my mind is I just taught a baptism class to a group of people. And the most important thing for people to understand when they're choosing to be baptized is we are not saved because we're baptized. We are baptized because we are saved. Amen? We don't, we don't earn God's favor. Same thing with communion. Just the physical act of taking communion, that does not save you. You take communion because you already believe and understand 
what the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus has done for you. So I want, I want you to pay attention here. Abraham and his son were circumcised. Now, John Phillips said this, the ordinance was given by God and was therefore of great significance, but as with any such ordinance, it is possible to go to one of two extremes. And I want to hit this hard because there are so many people who are confused by works versus faith. And there are so many people, and I'm sure some of you are watching, that still struggle. You've been raised in a church or taught that if you do certain religious things or go through certain religious ceremonies, that makes you right with God. And that is simply not true. So let's talk about it. John Phillips. We can overestimate its value. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about an ordinance, baptism, for example, or any particular ordinance. We can overestimate its value or we can underestimate its value. We can say there's really no importance about this ordinance at all. I can be saved and ignore it altogether. It's not essential to salvation. Maybe not. But it's certainly the basis of further growth in spiritual things. So watch this. The first extreme is you can say, well, all I got to do is trust in Jesus. I don't need to honor the Sabbath. I don't need to get baptized. I don't need to observe the Lord's Supper. I don't need to fellowship with other believers. I don't need to have a devotional life. Okay. You can go to that extreme. But maybe you don't need those things to be saved. However, you're not going to continue to grow and you're not going to experience the blessing of God when you stand in disobedience as a saved person. I hope I'm getting some amens out there. Now, the other extreme, the other extreme, which is very, very dangerous, is to say, if I submit to this ordinance, then I shall be saved. It is the ground of salvation. Without it, I can have no hope of heaven. Both extremes are wrong. And you know, uh, when I've been on TikTok these past few years, you see all kind of religious trends. You know, I've, I've had to talk to people and try to make videos addressing all kinds of things. You got people out there who say, if you're not baptized in water, you, you're damned to hell. You know, if you don't observe the Sabbath on Sunday or Saturday, or if you don't do this or you don't do that, I mean, you are damned to hell. And people go to both extremes. But the bottom line is this. Ordinances, things that God has told us to honor or to do, obedience follows salvation, but is very critical to spiritual growth and blessing. Very critical. Listen to what John Phillips said. He said, thus chapter 17 closes with a reference to circumcision as a limited ordinance. It did nothing to change the state of the rebellious man. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised. That is a significant statement. The number 13 in scripture is associated with rebellion. Ishmael was 13 when he was circumcised. He was a tender age of 13 when he was circumcised, when he, when he went through the ordinance that God had told him to go through. But guess what? It never saved him. It didn't change his heart of rebellion. So you can go ahead and push somebody to get baptized or push somebody to try to take communion or push somebody to tithe to the church or push somebody to do whatever thing you think that they need to do. But if they have not trusted in Jesus, if they have not yielded their heart to the Lord, they're still in a state of rebellion. They still stand in opposition to God, right? So that's not the thing. That's why I'm so excited about this baptism class. I got a group of 15 people who understand what this is. And they are rejoicing in what Jesus has already done. And so the blessing of being baptized is gonna be all the greater. You can't change the heart of a rebellious person by causing them to do some religious thing. By natural birth, Ishmael was a rebel and he remained a rebel to the end of his days. 
He had no heart and no mind for the things of God. On the contrary, he scoffed at them. Circumcision did nothing to change the heart of a rebel. Now, he was circumcised because Abraham was obedient. That was a part of Abraham's obedience and Abraham's example to everyone. You know, none of them could say, oh, well, Abraham stood in disobedience. They couldn't accuse him of being a hypocrite. You know, if, if the people in his household are going to turn against the Lord, Abraham's stance on that is not, under, not because of anything I've done. Amen? You may raise children. You may be friends with, you may be married to people who stand in rebellion against God. But here's the thing you got to be careful of. Just make sure you're not the reason that they're turned off to God. You do what God has called you to do. And I'm not talking about what you did before you knew Jesus Christ or before you really made that commitment to him. That is water under the bridge. And we get so many parents who contact us and say, now that I'm on fire for Jesus, I didn't get on fire for Jesus till later in my life. And now that I am, I really am heartbroken over my children or my adult children. I really messed up. You know what? When you submit that failure to God almighty, when you get down on your knees and you cry before the Lord and say, I'm heartbroken that I missed it. That I wasn't the kind of mom or dad that I should have been for Jesus during those years. Do you know what God does with that sin? He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. God has great mercy and long suffering. And God is not beating you up over that failure and neither should you be beating yourself up over that failure. You put that under the blood of Jesus and then you look the devil square in the eyes and say, you're not going to get me down with false guilt. Jesus has forgiven my sin and now I'm going to walk forward as best I can. And from this day forward, I'm going to live as I should as a servant of Jesus Christ. And all those people can now see me the way I am today. That's all you do. The Apostle Paul said, the past is the past. I got to leave the past behind and I press forward to know Jesus Christ. So that's just a little extra message in there because I know a lot of you struggle with that. But back to our point. Ishmael was not changed because his dad forced him to perform an ordinance. Okay. On the other hand, it did nothing to change the standing of the righteous man. Okay? It did nothing to change the state of the rebellious man, but it also did nothing to change the standing of the righteous man. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son and all the men of his house. Abraham was a righteous man long before he was circumcised. His circumcision simply manifested his inner obedience of heart. Amen? Abraham wasn't more saved after he was circumcised than before. And a person won't be more saved after they're baptized than before. But they will be blessed. Hallelujah. And others will be blessed. And it opens up the door of spiritual growth. So you're not saved because you commit a certain amount of time per day to reading the Bible and praying. But. Doing those things will open up a lot of spiritual growth for you. A lot of blessing in your life. All right, here we go. Now let's move on to Abraham's encounter with these three men. Chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. So interesting. I, I didn't plan this, but I was just thinking to myself, all Abraham's doing is having a normal day. He's just sitting at the door of his tent. Picture yourself sitting on your front porch, your lawn chair, you know, you're just doing your thing. He's just sitting there, an average, ordinary day. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus and a couple angels. How about that? Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever had it happen that you were just having an ordinary day and all of a sudden 
God came down, his presence was so palpable to you, or you just had your normal time of prayer, but it was just so different. You felt like God really met you, or you were reading the Bible, sitting at your kitchen table with your coffee, just going through what you normally go through, and all of a sudden, God blessed your heart. Just look what happens here. He's just sitting at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, nonetheless. And remember, no ibuprofen, no air conditioners. How about that? No air conditioners, no fans, right? This is the heat of the day. Now, before we go here, we're in Genesis 18, 1. I want to do a little overview of Genesis chapters 18 and 19 so you understand the context of what's happening. J. Vernon McGee, this chapter that we're entering, chapter 18, is a rather lengthy chapter in which God tells Abraham about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham intercedes on behalf of the cities of the plain. This is an illustration, I think, of the blessed Christian life, of life in fellowship with God. So in chapter 18, we're going to see Abraham intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see him talk this out with God. And J. Vernon McGee says this really talks about the blessed life. The person who is able to talk to God and make a difference. <clears throat> but in chapter 19, down in Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot, we will see what I would call the blasted life. All because of a decision that was made. So in chapter 18, you have a man who's able to talk with God and make a difference spiritually, the blessed life. But in chapter 19, you have Lot, a man of God who makes a very bad decision, who ends up in a very bad place. And J. Vernon McGee calls that, as, as opposed to a blessed life, a blasted life. And let that be a warning. There can be Christians who through their lack of obedience, through their ignorant I, I'm not going to say ignorant decisions because ignorance implies that you don't know better. Through their ridiculous, rebellious decisions, end up with a blasted life. McGee says, unfortunately, we have both kinds of Christians today. Those living a blessed life and those living a blasted life. There are those who have really made shipwreck of their lives. They've gotten entirely out of the will of God. And I think all of us maybe have had seasons like that. It becomes a real problem when that's the pattern of your life as a Christian. I would not suggest even for a moment that they've lost their salvation. But they sure have lost everything else. As Paul says, they are saved yet so as by fire. Now I want to have a little dramatic pause here and I want to talk about this for just a minute before we move on. McGee says, I wouldn't suggest for a moment that, that they lost their salvation. And I, I've done TikToks and videos on this. You know, everybody wants to debate, is it possible to lose your salvation, blah, blah, blah. And I, I say it's the wrong question to ask. You know, the right question to ask is, am I truly saved? Because honestly, when you're truly saved, you'll see the fruit and you'll know that you're saved. And I don't want to go down that road right now. But what he is saying has so much value. Even if they haven't lost their salvation, even if they are Christians, it's possible that you can lose everything else. Think about that. And I'm not talking about lose everything else in life. You can lose relationships. You can lose peace of mind. You can lose sanity, you can lose homes, money. There's all kinds of things you can lose as a result of rebellion. But I'm talking about eternal loss. You see, Shelley, can a Christian suffer loss in heaven? 100% absolutely yes. The Bible from start to finish indicates that there are levels of punishment in hell and there are levels of reward in heaven and i do want to turn for context sake to this passage that j vernon mcgee is speaking of so if you have your bibles 
Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. just want to pause here and, and talk about this for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, you'll hear people say, well, it's just enough if I make it to heaven. Well, yes, making it to heaven is infinitely greater than being in hell. That's true. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 with me, and I'm going to read a little bit more than just the verse I have up there. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, and uh, here's what he says in verse 10. I'm going to pick up at verse 10. This has to do with the judgment seat of Christ, by the way. Paul says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon that foundation. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul first says, you can't even begin to build. You can't begin to build a life. You can't be able to build heavenly treasure unless you have the foundation. Amen? And the only foundation is Jesus. So if you don't have Jesus, you can't really build anything lasting at all. But if you have Jesus, you should begin to build that. When Jesus comes along and by his grace gives you that free foundation, he will also give you the ability to build on that foundation. You will be able to contribute to the kingdom of God. I don't know what you're calling to contribute is. It could be significant prayer and intercession for other people. It could be one-on-one -on -one Bible study with others. It could be that you're called to witness and to try to hand out Bibles to people. It could be that you're supposed to relationally at your workplace talk about Jesus Christ. It could be that you have a calling within uh, ministry as your vocation. It could be that you are to be the kind of parent that brings your children to the Lord. Whatever it is, you're called to build. All right, now listen. Paul says, if anyone builds on the foundation of Jesus with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. So they can use different substances, and, and he's speaking metaphorically. Gold, silver, and precious stones, as we know, they last. They have value, and they will continue on. Wood, hay, and straw... You set a match to wood, hay, and straw, and guess what? It goes up. Listen. He said, each one's work will become manifest. It will become obvious what our work is. And then he, this, this beautiful phrase, for the day, with a capital D, for the day will disclose it. So the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, when we stand before the Lord, the day of the Lord, with a capital D, will make obvious what kind of work we did for his kingdom. The day will make obvious what kind of structure I built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So Paul's talking to Christians here, not the unsaved. And here's what he says. Our work will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each person has done. So metaphorically, there's a fire. And that's why the substance is there. Wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and straw. That's going up in flames, right? Here's what he says. If anyone's work, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives. Now listen. After the fire passes over it, if the work that you built on the foundation of Jesus survives, you will receive a reward. Now, if anybody tries to tell you that's selfish or that's wrong, you shouldn't be serving the Lord expecting a reward, tell them to go to the Bible. Rewards are God's idea. Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Basic scripture about faith, reward. Right here, the Bible says, if the work 
that you have built on the foundation of Jesus survives the test of God's fire, you will receive a reward. Here's the scary part. If anyone's work is burned up, if when it passes through the fire of God's judgment, God says, nope, that was not, that was not done for my glory. That was done out of wrong motivation. That was done out of selfishness. That wasn't worthy work. That was wasted time. That was wasted effort. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Okay, so the one person gets reward and the other person suffers what? And listen, both are Christians. I hope somebody out there is hearing me tonight. This has to do with the judgment seat of Christ is what we're talking about here. Both are Christians. One receives reward, one suffers loss. Now look what Paul says. He will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, in the New Living Translation, it says, if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I want you to think about that for a minute. There are going to be some Christians that on the day that they face the judgment seat of Christ at the return of the Lord, there are going to be some Christians who are going to stand before the Lord and they are going to be welcomed into heaven. But as they are simultaneously to being welcomed into heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to look behind them. And they're going to watch their entire earthly life go up in smoke. And they'll get through. But as one escaping from a burning building because everything that they are leaving behind is burning to the ground and is gone. They're taking themselves to heaven, but they're not taking anybody else to heaven with them. They don't have any heavenly treasure there. There won't be people in heaven to say thank you for helping me to get here. They'll have lost everything. All the status that they lived for, the career they lived for, the big home that they lived for, the selfishness, the entertainment, all that, gone up in smoke, but they get to enter heaven. I'll tell you what, I don't want to be that person. And my main motivation for not wanting to be that person is I believe. I believe in eternity. I believe in heaven. I believe that I am going to meet the Savior. And I got news for you. If you honestly believe that there is a hell and there is a heaven, if you say, I'm a Christian, I really believe that there is a heaven. I really believe that there is a hell. I really believe that Jesus is the only way to eternal life. How can you say that and not live to serve him? And not live in such a way as to help others get to him. And so this judgment is very, very real. I love what J. Vernon McGee does here. He says, listen, chapter 18 is about a blessed life. It's about Abraham, a man of God who lived for God, who invested his life in the things of God, who had relationship, who interceded for people who were in trouble. As the example of Sodom and Gomorrah is going to show us. And then, in chapter 19, we have Lot, the man of God who lived a blasted life, who actually caused trouble for the blessed person, Abraham, who wreaked all kind of havoc. So much loss in Lot's life and what he's remembered for. Amen? We do not want our Christian life to end up like that kind 
of light. Soon after the marvelous theophany and covenant described in Genesis 17, Abraham had another visit from God. This, however, was not an appearance of God in his glory, but rather was in the form of a man and two friends traveling through Hebron in the heat of the day. And I think I'm going to pause it here. I know that we have maybe a couple of minutes left, but I don't want to press this any further because we'll save this for next week. We'll do part two. I just want to back it up and we'll leave it on the note that we left it about the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Some major things. Let's, since we have a couple minutes left and we want to pray, I want you to think about what you have felt most struck by the Holy Spirit with in this message tonight. Was it the part about age, children, not discounting the work of God in a young life or in an old life, right? That the work of God spans the ages? Is that something that God hit you with? Did he hit you with the fact that Abraham was willing to circumcise all the males in his household, even if it put his household at risk? Because he trusted that if God told me to do it, God's going to take care of me. There is safety and obedience, a safety and refuge and protection in obedience. Amen. Did God strike you with what we talked about concerning the blessed life versus the blasted life? Has God spoken to you concerning the fact that observing religious things and doing religious things or churchy things or Christian things, doing those things does not make you a saved person. Rather, we do them as a result of being saved. And that even if you try to force someone to do something, it doesn't change their rebellious heart. Only God, only Jesus Christ can change a rebellious heart and some of you I know the Lord spoke to you because he laid it on my heart to add that part some of you needed to hear about the forgiveness of failures in your past concerning your children or things that you've done and people that haven't been led to Jesus by you God says put that in the past put that under the blood it's under the blood according to God it has to stay under the blood according to you and live for him now Let's all make a commitment together during this prayer time that we are going to live with an eye unto that day with a capital D. How many of you'd like to do that? Let's be thinking every day about the day we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and how much joy it will bring to look at Jesus on that day and say, because of you, Jesus, because of your salvation, because you laid the foundation for me to build, I now offer to you this life. I offer to you the, the two years or the 30 years or the 43 years. I offer to you all the years since I've been saved. Here's what I have built by your strength, Jesus, and by your grace. And then when you enter into the kingdom of God, you'll see people there who say you were part of the reason that I am in heaven with Jesus. That's a good note to end our Bible study on, is it not? So I don't want you to tune out. We didn't go late today. I don't want anybody to tune out. I want you to stay tuned in and we are going to pray. I want you to pause and think for a minute. What did God specifically lay on your heart from tonight's message? And for some of you, it may be this. I need to get saved. I need to trust in Jesus. I want to be a true Christian. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so, so much for your precious word tonight. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I really do believe, God, that you touched some hearts in a major way tonight. And I do want to pray, whatever that thing is that any particular person has in their heart right now where they've said, God, you hit me there with that. In a convicting way or in a comforting way, 
whatever it is, Lord, take it home. Take it way down deep into their soul. Give them the grace to wrestle with that concept this week. Give them the grace, give them the strength to pull out your word, to pray, to read, and to wrestle with that this week. Let us live with an eye until the day that we see your face and stand before you and answer for the grace that you've given to let us build on such an awesome foundation. And God, for that person right now who's listening and saying, wow, I wish I knew that I was right with God. I wish I knew that Jesus was my savior, my forgiver. For that person, I pray right now. And I would ask you, whoever you are, wherever you are, God is there. Just call out to him and say, Jesus, save me. And he will save you, my friend. He will begin a mighty work in your life. Thank you, Lord. You've done awesome things here tonight. We bring praise and honor and glory to you. In Jesus, precious, mighty, great, great name. Amen. Amen. Before we go, I just want to remind you that if you are being fed by Hope and Passion Ministries, and I know so many of you are, we need you because that's the way God provides for us to pray about giving. If God's feeding you an act of obedience, it doesn't save you, but you'll receive blessing, spiritual blessing for investing in the kingdom of God. And, and just one more thing. If you're a giver to Hope and Passion Ministries, that's part of what you're building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What the money that you sacrifice to give what's happening through this ministry, you're going to see it again one day in the form of souls, people you're going to meet that are there because you gave. Thank you for your investment. We are praying for you. Be here next Tuesday night. We'll go to part two of this same message, and I'll see you live on Sunday morning at 10.